Anyway, we got that issue uh, figured out. But it certainly is good to see all of you here this morning. And what a blessing it is for us to be able to assemble together as God's people uh, to feed our souls, to feed our minds, to feed uh, the person that God has created us with His Word. And I hope that we can do that this morning. I hope that our minds have already been engaged with God as we have prayed together, as we have sung together, and as we have an opportunity to open His Word together. If you have your New Testament with you, you can open to the passage that our brother Kerry read for us just a few moments ago as we began our assembly to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is where we will be uh, in the Word of God this morning. Uh, If you were in Kirk's uh, class this morning, we talked as we're thinking this quarter about Uh, daily uh, living as a Christian, about next level living as a Christian, how we can take maybe some rather simple basic concepts that most of us know that are children of God, how we can expand upon those in our life and we can uh, grow in our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another and we can be more conformed to the image of His Son Jesus Christ. As we're thinking about all those topics uh, this quarter, we thought today in the class about getting into the Word of God and how important it is for us to have a daily, a continual relationship with God through His Word. And we thought about digging deeper into the Word of God and not just studying God's Word, but meditating upon it. And I think our lesson this morning here from James chapter 1 will really even expound upon that. So if you were in that class, maybe you can keep those thoughts in mind. If you weren't, I think our lesson will still be helpful and applicable to you all of us. If we are really honest with ourselves, I believe that we, if, if we've lived any time at all, we have all been guilty of participating in a Bible class or listening to a sermon or just sitting down in the quiet and the comfort of our home or maybe our office at work or wherever it is that we have to get into God's Word of just sitting down and reading God's Word on our own only to walk away without putting what we have said, maybe in participating in that class, or what we have heard in listening to a sermon, or what we have read as we have gotten into the Word of God ourselves, without really putting those things into practice in our lives. I would think that most of us who are Christians, we have good intentions. We have the intention, we usually walk away with the intention of learning or letting rather God's Word dwell in our hearts, of letting God's Word really get into who we are and change us. But too often I find, at least in my life, and it's probably been in yours as well, that it is the case that once we close our Bible, that we have the tendency to fail to do what it has said. If you this morning can relate in any way at all to this common challenge, and I think it is something that all of us deal with from time to time in our life, I would urge you to hear what James says about our need to be doers of the Word. As we think about this phrase, being doers of the Word, I want us to think about it and kind of break it down into two uh, different steps. They are two independent steps, but they are two steps that are related to one another. For us, number one, James says here in this text in James chapter 1, for us to be doers of the Word and not just hearers of the Word, we first must hear the Word of God, and then we must receive the Word of God. Hearing God's Word certainly is the foundation for who we are if we are a child of God, if we are a follower of His Son, Jesus Christ. Hearing the Word of God is the very foundation, is the very core of our faith. It is what allows us to come to faith in God and who God is and who His Son Jesus Christ is and who the Holy Spirit is and what God has done for us and what God is asking of us in our life as we're going to live in a way that pleases Him. Hearing the Word of God is the foundation for all of that that relates to our faith, not just coming to faith, but also living our faith out in our life each day and growing in our faith in Him, which means that hearing God's Word is the very first step in being a doer of the Word of God, because obviously we cannot do what we have first not heard. But as James says to us here in our text, as we're looking at this morning at verse 22, that we need to prove ourselves being doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves, he is not just thinking about, okay, I've come and I've sat in a church building for three hours on a Sunday morning, 
I, I listen to Gavin's sermon at 9 o'clock. I, I, I listen to the Bible class, whichever class I was in, at uh, 9.45. And now at 10.40, I'm listening to the Word of God. As James uses this language of being hearers of, uh, being doers of the Word, and not just hearers, he is talking here about something that is more than just audibly receiving what is being said or what is being read, but it is listening with a view toward learning about God. It is listening with a view toward not only learning what God has said about maybe how we need to live in our life, but it is listening with a view toward conforming ourselves to the Word of God, that we come with that commitment, we come with that desire, that whatever God has said, whatever that means for me in my life, whatever change I need to make, however I can be more like God, that is what I'm going to do. I want you to notice just several things here in our text this morning. Notice back at verse 19, where I think James really begins this thought that we are considering this morning of being doers of the word. He says to us in verse 19, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. James says we must be individuals when we come to the Word of God that we are quick to hear. What is he talking about there? I think he's talking about coming with an eagerness, as we talked about in Kirk's class already this morning, about those who were in Berea, that they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. They were, came to the Word of God with a great eagerness, a great excitement. They were enthusiastic when it came to learning what God had to say in His Word. James says we need to be that kind of hearer, that we are quick to hear, that we are ready to hear what God's Word has to say to us. Notice in verse 22, again James says, But prove yourselves doers of the Word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. In order for us to be doers, we can't be, James says, merely hearers. We can't be hearers only, as some of the translations say. We must certainly hear the Word of God before we can do it. But he says if that's the entirety of the process, if that's the entirety of our connection with God's Word, then we haven't gone far enough. Sometimes, though, I think as we hear God's Word, as we come with a good heart, as we come with good desires to know what God has said to us, to truly grow in our knowledge of who God is and what He wants of us as His children, as we hear God's Word, sometimes there is interference. And so before we can truly receive God's Word, James says to us back in verse 21, that what we need to do is we need to get that interference out of our heart and out of our life. Notice what he says there at verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the Word implanted, which is able to save your souls. James says we must remove some things before we come to the Word of God, before we can truly listen with the intent of wanting it to change us and conform us into the image of His Son, before we can truly receive that Word into our heart and plant it deep in our heart. James says we must remove the filthy, wicked, sinful thoughts, words, and actions so that we can fully receive that, that word receive, according to one Bible dictionary, it says it's the idea of embracing. It's the idea of approving of what God has said. We, we may understand, maybe as we read a part of God's Word, that it's something that's very difficult for us to do, something that may be very challenging, something that is going to require a great change, that we're going to have to stop going in one direction and go in a different direction. But he says we need to remove all the filth out of our hearts so that we can fully embrace and approve God's Word and put it into our hearts. And he says in all of that, we need to have the right attitude. We need to come to the Word of God with a very humble, a very gentle spirit, so that we can deeply implant the Word of God in our hearts. It is only then, when God's Word has taken root in our hearts, that it can truly save our souls, as James tells us here at the end of verse 21. I want you to notice here in this point about hearing and receiving God's Word, about what James says about it. I want you to notice that both negative and positive action is required for our salvation when it comes to the Word of God, that we have to clean the filth from our heart so that we can receive the Word of God, but then we have to humbly plant God's Word in our heart. Sometimes, sometimes, 
I think it has been true in my life, and maybe it's been true in your life as well, that maybe we're pretty good about coming to the Word of God and we see all the things that God in His Word and His wisdom tell us, don't do these things, don't be this kind of person, get these kind of thoughts and attitudes and actions out of your life, and maybe we're really focused on that particular part of the process. But once that has taken place, are we just as diligent? Are we just as eager and just as excited about the positive things that are said in the Word of God? About how we can then fill that void in our heart and in our life and we can grow up in Jesus Christ? Notice also verse 25 here of this text. James says, But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. James is giving his readers then and us today an admonition, a warning here, and that is this, that we must not, when we come to the Word of God, we must not just come taking a casual glance at what we have heard or what we have read. No, he says we must be people who are looking intently at God's perfect, complete law of liberty. We must be people, when we come to the Word of God, who are kind of investigators, if you will. That we're coming not, not to find fault with God, obviously. Not even coming to the Word to find fault with someone else. But we're coming to the Word to do some thorough investigation, to do some individual examination of what we have just read, of what we have just heard from Him. Because we come with that desire to want to be changed, to be more like our great God. And so number one in this process of being doers of the Word, James says to us that we must be good hearers. We must be good receivers of the Word before we can be doers of it. And then secondly, very simply, but very importantly, we need to do what God's Word says. Notice back again at verse 22. James once again says you need to prove yourselves. You need to show yourselves as people who are doers of the Word. Because if we have only heard God's Word, but we don't really do God's Word, we don't do anything about what we have heard, James says we are people who are self-deceived. We are people who are deluding ourselves. How do we deceive or delude ourselves? Well, when all we do is hear the Word of God. We, we may think that perhaps in some way because we've had an association with the Word of God that we're righteous people, that we're religious people, that we're trying to live in a way that pleases God. We may think that we know God really well because we've heard His Word. But that may have just taken place on a very intellectual, academic level. As we've already pointed out in the first point, certainly uh, James is not minimizing, and I hope you don't get the impression that I'm minimizing in any way the importance of us hearing the Word of God. We do need to know His Word, but James is telling us here if we don't do His Word, we're not truly pleasing to Him. Notice what he goes on to say here as he kind of fleshes out uh, that thought in verse 22 in verses 23 and 24. He says, If anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Here, here is James, as you read through the book of James, it's just a very practical book. It, it is something that I think his readers could certainly relate to, but it's something that all of us can relate to, as it gives us wisdom for living out our faith each day. But here in this book, James, verses 23 and 24, James uses a very simple, but I think in some ways a very absurd illustration to show just how ridiculous it is for us to come and say, yeah, I've heard the Word of God. For us to look into God's Word, to hear it, and to do nothing about what we see in the Word of God, to not let it change our spiritual appearance, as, you, as it were, as a result of what it says. He says, it's just like getting up in the morning and you look into the mirror. Maybe for many of us, that's kind of a scary picture, isn't it? We're not put together when we get up in the morning, get out of bed. Maybe our hair, hair is all over the place, it's disheveled. Maybe our, our, if those of us who are men who have beards, maybe our beard isn't trimmed. Maybe our teeth aren't brushed. Maybe we just kind of look like a mess. And James says, sometimes, sadly, we do that with the Word of God. We're very good about hearing what God's Word has to say, 
But maybe we have missed the next important step, just as important, just as vital, that we do, that we live out what we have heard. How often is it the case, going back to the introduction this morning as I ask, how often has it been true for you that you've sat through a class, maybe you've listened to a podcast, you've listened to a sermon, you have sat down and read God's Word on your own, and then it just completely leaves your mind. How often do we hear a good sermon or a good podcast? How often do we read maybe a a very thought-provoking article about the Word of God? How often do we study the Word on our own? And James says here at verse 24, how often are we like this man that he describes here that immediately he forgets what kind of person he was? How often are we a forgetful hearer? as James talks about here at verse 25, rather than an effectual doer. And so as we are trying to be people who are growing in our knowledge of God and growing in our walk with Him, as we read the Bible, as we study the Bible, as we meditate upon the Bible, and I appreciate uh, what was discussed in, in class this morning about meditation. I think there's so much that is said in the Word about meditation. Maybe most of us don't really sit down and think about God's Word as we should. But as we are doing those things, let us do so with the purpose of putting what we have heard into practice so that it changes who we are. Certainly it is a great blessing that we have to be able to hear God's Word. But James says the true blessing comes when we do His Word. Notice what he says there at verse verse, um, 25 that this man, the effectual doer, this man, will be blessed in what he does. So that's kind of the foundation, I think, here of being doers of the Word. Let's think about three practical proofs that James gives us here. Number one, he says, if we're truly trying to be doers of the Word, this is how we can know that we are being doers of the Word. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but these are three things that he points out here in our text. Number one, he says, if we're truly trying to be doers of the Word, we can know by what comes out of our mouths. We need to be people who are bridling our tongues. Notice what he says there again at verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. It is not enough, again, James is telling us here, to think that we are godly people simply because we have heard the Word, because we know what the Word of God says about something. He says, it will be shown in the way that we speak. We must be people who are bridling our tongues. What what does a bridle do? I don't know how many of us are familiar with horses. I mean, I, I have never ridden a horse. I think a couple of our kids have. Maybe some of you have or at least a pony. Uh, Maybe we're not too familiar with horses or think about horses much in our day-to-day life. But a bridle is that piece of equipment. It, it, along with the bit, restrains that horse. It disciplines that horse or trains that horse. It is really, in in fact, what controls that massive animal. We, We, as a person, compared to a large horse, we would think, well, the horse has the advantage there. But this piece of equipment can control that very powerful animal. And James uses that imagery here to say, this is how you know if you truly are a doer of the Word of God, that you, just like that horse, you will bridle your tongue. So it is with our mouths. Hearing and receiving God's Word should result in us controlling what we say in us controlling how we say that, in in us controlling the motivation for saying something, why we are saying it. And I will tell you, I know James lived and wrote this book a long, long time ago when there wasn't the modern technology we have today. Certainly there is an application here from this particular verse, verse 26 of James 1, to how we speak to one another in person. But what about our online communication? What about on social media? When we're sitting behind a a screen and a keyboard and no one can see our face and we can't perhaps see the face of someone else and we're just typing away, that that is a a manifestation of who we are. We, We are speaking in a sense. And so even in our online communication with other people, we need to be people who are bridling our tongues. 
Why, why do you think, and I don't know James' reasoning, he doesn't give us his reasoning here, but why do you think it is that James points out here at verse 26 that controlling our tongues is evidence that we are a doer of the Word of God? There are at least two reasons I have thought of. Number one, from what Jesus says there at Matthew 15 and verse 18 as he is being questioned by the uh, religious leaders about the traditions that they have added on to the law of God and eating with un unwashed hands. And Jesus says it's not really that which goes into the person, the heart of the person that defiles them, it's what comes out of their heart. So number one, what comes out of our mouths is really a reflection of what is truly in our hearts. Whatever we are putting into our hearts, whatever we are putting into the core of who we really are as people, that is going to be reflected in our speech. That is going to be reflected not just in the, the words that come out of our mouth, but why they come out of our mouth and how they come out of our mouth. But secondly, controlling our mouths is directly connected to controlling our bodies. I want you to turn over, if you have your Bible this morning, to the third chapter of this little book of James. In James chapter 3, at verse 2, he talks to us more extensively about our tongues and the great good that our tongues can do, but also the great evil that can be done. Notice what he says there at verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle. There's that idea of bridling. Able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. James is saying, if we cannot control our mouths, I think he's saying here, if we cannot control our mouths, we really can't control anything else about ourselves. How, how do we think we're going to be, get, be able to control our bodies if we can't control our mouths? It's a very small member of the body, and yet it has a lot of power to do good or to do bad. If we don't control our tongues, coming back to the language again that we just spoke of in James chapter 1, we are deceiving ourselves. And our religion, James says, is useless. So number one, being a doer of the word means controlling our tongues. Number two, James says here in our text at verse 27, that being doers of the Word of God, not just hearers only, means that we are going to visit those who are orphans and widows. Notice verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. The word visit means here to look upon or to look after, to inspect in order to see how a person is. It is more than just entering into someone's home or entering into someone's room that may be in the hospital or in the nursing home or in rehab or somewhere like that and just saying hi to them. And then we said, we've done our job. We, we've checked that box of visiting those who are in need. No, it is the idea, James says, of finding out one's needs with the intent of providing help for that particular person. Maybe someone is in financial need and we can provide financial help for them. Maybe they are in emotional need and they just need a friend. They just need a companion to talk to, to converse with. Maybe they have some physical need that they have something that needs to be repaired around their house. Their yard needs to be mowed. They need someone to go get groceries for them. Whatever the case may be, James says if we're truly going to put this into practice in our life, we've got to be people who are visiting those who are orphans and widows. We're doing some investigation, as we talked about earlier, with the Word of God, but now we're doing some investigation into that person and their life and their needs and their concerns, and we're looking for a way that we can help them. Well, you might be asking yourself the question, maybe you're not, but I'm, as I think about this text, ask the question, why orphans and widows? Two reasons I can think of. Number one, generally speaking, they have a harder time caring for themselves. They, they are people who have lost a parent or both parents. They, they are people who have lost a spouse. They are people who have lost family who are near and dear to their hearts, those who may have been able to provide their financial needs or may have been able to provide their emotional or, or relational needs or take care of their physical needs for them, and now they don't have those people in their life. But number two, because God shows a special care for them. If you look at the text that I have here on the screen, one of many that we could consider this morning from the Psalms, go there to Psalm 68 for just a moment. <clears throat> 
Psalm 68 that shows God's attitude, God's concern for those who are orphans and widows. Psalm 68 at verse 5. The psalmist here says, A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God has a special care for those who find themselves in this situation. And when these people that James describes for us here in verse 27 of James 1, when they are in distress, when they are in a time of trouble and need in their life, he is saying if we're truly being people who are trying to do the Word of God, we'll not just say that we care about them or that we love them, but we will show in our actions, if possible, we will be people who will come to their aid. Yet, again, it takes some honesty. And there's a lot of honesty, I think, that is required of us here when we come to James chapter 1. I want you to ask yourself, you don't have to answer this, you don't have to tell anybody else your answer, but answer very honestly in your own heart, how often do you forget about those kind of people? I mean, most of us in this congregation, we live very busy lives. Some, some of us are parents, a number of us are parents, and we have small children. And certainly that, that is our role, that is our, our fundamental responsibility to take care of those children, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But even as we have children, how often do we think about those who are widows and orphans, maybe even among us? And I don't know that it's, I don't think this text is just limited to widows and orphans. I think he's really using that as an illustration of a greater point here. But any brother or sister that we see in need, anyone who, even who is not a Christian is outside the body of Christ, that we as individuals, we know them, we have a relationship with them, and they are in need of, of something that we can provide for them. How often do we kind of go about our daily life and we really don't take much thought or much notice of them? If we're not parents at home raising children, we have jobs. Some Christians here in this congregation own their own businesses. We're involved, some of us, in, in what's going on in our communities and all those things. I'm not now playing any of that work. It's all good work. But how often do we, how often do I, forget about these kind of people? How often have we heard this verse, James 1 and verse 27, even understood what it means, that this is our responsibility as God's people, but we just haven't gotten around to doing it yet? I will tell you, and if you've been a member of this congregation, you probably know this, maybe you don't, but our congregation here at Fairview is just filled with people who seem to be very good, in my estimation, about visiting orphans and widows. About sending a card or sending a text, if maybe that's all you have the opportunity to do, or giving a phone call. But going and seeing about people here in this church who are in need, and even people out in the world. Sometimes I think, at least from my experience growing up, hearing about James 1 and verse 27, a lot of what I heard was what it doesn't say. <laughs> and I do believe very much that this is, an, this is an instruction that is given to us as individuals. But maybe not hearing as much as I should have heard, maybe it was my fault, about what it does say. And it does say something very, very important for us. So secondly, being a doer of the word means visiting or caring for those people who are in need. And then thirdly and finally, James says, here is another evidence or proof in your life if you're truly a doer of the word that you're going to keep yourself unstained from the world. And that's where he ends the passage and the chapter here in James chapter 1. When you think about the world James lived in, you think about the world that we lived in, it's always been the case since sin has been in the world that the world at large has a polluting influence upon God's people. It is not enough for us to just be able to identify from Scripture the sinful activities and the sinful actions of the world. I mean, we need to do that. But we must also daily practice godliness in an ungodly world. It's kind of what we talked about earlier about our own relationship with God and our own 
uh, attitude and disposition of heart when we come to the Word of God. Yes, James says to us earlier in the text, we need to remove all the filth, all the hindrances, all the interference from our heart and our mind when we come to the Word of God so we can truly take it in and think about it and dwell on it and apply it and live it out in our life. But it's not just enough, brothers and sisters, that we know some things that the world is involved in are wrong from Scripture. He says we must be daily practicing a godly life in an ungodly world. I know that's very difficult for us to do. I'm sure that was difficult for James and his audience to do in the first century. But as much as is possible, we must keep ourselves away from the pollutions of the world we're not talking here about removing ourselves from the world. Jesus spoke about that in the Sermon on the Mount. We've got to be out there in the world, interacting with our world. We've got to be the salt of the, the earth and the light of the world. But as we are living in our world, we have to check ourselves and make sure that we are not being polluted, that our clean heart is not being made dirty by the world. Just to get very practical here, does what we watch on TV or what we watch online, does that really reflect that we're trying to keep ourselves unstained from the world? I, I was speaking, I think, with uh, Brother Gavin here last week. Um, we were riding together in, in the car and uh, talking about a, a movie that our family went to see. And he was talking about a movie that he and Elaine uh, had saw. And uh, we were just thinking, I mean, as a parent, I, I look at reviews of movies before we watch those as a family, before our kids watch those. And even PG movies these days may have some language that we don't want our children to hear, that we don't want to hear as Christians. It may have some, some innuendos, maybe some things that may pass perhaps our children by, given their age. They may not really be attuned to what's being said or what's being uh, the idea that's being promoted, but we as adults know that. It is very difficult for us. It is very challenging for us. I don't deny that at all. But what we allow into our minds, what we allow into our hearts visually, does that reflect that we're trying to keep ourselves unstained from the world? Thinking about our online presence, about social media, does what we post or like or share, what we read even on social media, does it show that we're trying to be people who are keeping ourselves unstained from the world, that we're trying to be people who have clean and pure hearts before God? Does what we wear demonstrate that? We talked about that, I think, a little bit last year in a lesson about Christians and clothing, that God doesn't give us a dress code per se. He gives us a lot of principles, a lot of truths, that we have to wrestle with those from time to time. And we have to come to some decision, some conclusion about what we're going to wear, how we're going to present ourselves to the world. But does what we wear demonstrate that we're trying to keep ourselves unstained from the world? Does what we spend our time and our money on prove that? You know, it's been said oftentimes, and I think there's a lot of truth in it, that you can tell what's really important to a person by how they spend their time and how they spend their money. Many of us, I would assume, being good Bible students, we know these verses that I have here on the screen. We know passages like Romans 12 and verse 2, where Paul instructs us there not to be conformed to the world. We know what he says in Philippians 2 and verse 15, that we are to be kind of like the Sermon on the Mount, being lights in the world. We are to prove ourselves to be blameless, he says, and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We know what James says later on here in James chapter 4 and verse 4, that we are not to... Uh, do you not know, he says, that friendship with the world is hostility toward God, that we have to make a choice between being friends with the world or friends with God? We remember what John wrote in 1 John 2 and verse 15 where he says there, we're not to love the world or the things in the world. We know all of these passages. I'm sure many of us that have lived for a number of years, we've heard these passages quoted over and over again. We've heard sermons just on these particular texts. But how many of us are doing the instructions that these texts contain? You see, being a doer of the world, James says, means keeping ourselves clean from the corrupting influence of the world because God has called us to be different, not for difference's sake, but God has called us to be the salt of the earth. 
God has called us to be the light of the world. God, the holy, awesome God that He is, He has called us to be His chosen people. He has called us, as we're thinking about this morning, to be doers of the Word that He has given us. We can be good hearers and receivers of God's Word, and we certainly need to be. But if we don't do His Word, if we do not live that out in our life, if we are not practicing pure and undefiled religion, as James talks about in our text, then we are not pleasing to Him. We're just fooling ourselves and perhaps someone else. So as we wrap up our sermon this morning, let me just encourage all of us. Let us resolve this week, let us resolve today, that we're going to be doers of the Word. You, you may be, maybe your mind is already thinking, well, I've got to make this change and I've got to improve in this area. And just, we kind of get overwhelmed with all that. But let's just make the commitment today that today I'm going to be a doer of God's Word. And then tomorrow we make that same commitment that I'm going to be a doer of God's Word. And before long it becomes our habit, it becomes who we are, that we're not just people who are good listeners and good hearers of the Word, but we are people who are trying to hear with the intent of doing it in our life. What about you this morning? Maybe something that we've said in the sermon this morning has touched your heart. And maybe you realize that, yeah, you've, you've heard a lot of sermons, you've been to a lot of Bible classes, you've read the Word of God on your own, but it really hasn't made an impact on your life. It's time to do something about that. It's time to act on that this morning. As a song of encouragement and invitation, ask us this question, why do you wait? If you know that you need to be right with God, if you know that you need to be in a relationship with Him, once you enter into that relationship this morning, you can take those first few steps by coming before this audience, confessing your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And upon that confession, you can be baptized into Jesus Christ, having already made the determination that you're going to repent of your sins. You're going to change your life and conform your life to His will. If you have started down that path, and James was not writing this book, by the way, to those who were outside of Christ. He was writing it to Christians. And you've started down that path, that journey with Jesus Christ. But somewhere along the way, you've just kind of, your senses have become dull. And maybe you're still hearing God's Word audibly, but you're not really listening to it as you should. And it's not changing who you are, not affecting your life. And that has caused sin to come into your life. Just take care of that between you and God. If you need the help and the prayers and the encouragement of your brethren in that process, we stand ready to help you in any way that we can. Think about that this morning as we sing this song. Am I a doer of the word? And if you need to respond to the invitation of Jesus in any way, do that now as we stand and as we sing.